Imagine a world where the sky might be a different shade of blue, where the oceans are so deep they have no end, and gravity pulls you with double the force you feel right now, sitting in that chair. Imagine a place that, in our telescope data, looks so much like our home that we dare to call it Earth 2.0. But how long would we take on a trip to this possible new home? This is Kepler 22b. Since its confirmation by NASA, it has become the poster child for the search for extraterrestrial life. It is out there, right now, orbiting its star, perhaps harboring clouds, rain, or even something alive looking back at us. But there is a problem, a gigantic, silent, and terrifying problem that most newspaper headlines ignore when talking about new Earths. The problem is the abyss. The distance between us and Kepler is so vast that it defies human comprehension. If you got into the fastest vehicle ever built by humanity today, you would die long before completing 1% of the trip. Your grandchildren would die. The entire human civilization could collapse and be reborn, and the ship would still be in the middle of the void. Today we are not just going to talk about the planet. We are going to pack our bags. We are going to calculate, with precision, how long it would take to get there using the technology we have today, and what would be necessary, between real science and theoretical fiction, for a human being to one day set foot on that alien soil. Before we leave, we need to understand why this destination is worth the risk. Why Kepler 22b? The universe is full of floating rocks, but this exoplanet is special. Located in the constellation of Cygnus, the Swan, Kepler 22b was the first planet confirmed by the Kepler telescope orbiting inside the habitable zone of a star similar to the Sun. The habitable zone, often called the Goldilocks zone, is that magical region of space where it isn't too hot for water to evaporate, nor too cold for it to freeze. It is the place where liquid water, the essential ingredient for life as we know it, can exist on the surface. Its star is a G-type yellow dwarf, very similar to our own sun, just a little smaller and cooler. This means that the light bathing that world has a familiar quality. But the similarities stop there. Kepler 22b is a super-Earth. It has about 2.4 times the radius of our planet. And here enters the mystery that keeps astronomers awake at night. We don't know what it is made of. With this size, it could be a giant rocky world with mountains and massive continents. But it could also be an ocean world covered entirely by a sea hundreds of kilometers deep without a single piece of dry land. Or worse for us, it could be a mini Neptune, a rock core suffocated by a dense atmosphere of unbreathable gas where the pressure would crush any visitor instantly. Despite the uncertainty, the possibility of a temperate world with water and a stable star is enough to ignite our imagination. If there is life there, it had billions of years to evolve. If there are oceans, what kinds of creatures swim in their depths? The reward is high, but the price to get there is the distance. Kepler is located approximately 600 to 635 light years away from Earth. Put like that, 600 seems like a small number. You drive 600 kilometers to visit a relative. But in space, light years is not a measure of time. It is a measure of distance. A light year is the distance that light travels in a vacuum in one Earth year. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. In a snap of fingers, light could go around the Earth seven and a half times. Let's put this in perspective. Light takes about 1.3 seconds to reach the moon. It takes eight minutes to reach the sun, to cross our entire solar system, to Pluto. Light takes about five and a half hours. Now, think about this. The light that left Kepler 22b and that the Kepler telescope captured departed from there when the Middle Ages were ending in Europe. When Columbus was sailing to the Americas, that light had already been traveling for almost a century. In kilometers, we are talking about approximately 5 quadrillion and 600 trillion kilometers. 
It is the number five followed by 15 zeros. It is an abyss so deep that our human mind evolved to hunt and gather in the savannas simply cannot process it. But our mathematics can, and the numbers for a physical trip are discouraging. Let's assume we decided to go now. We gathered the best engineers from NASA, from SpaceX, from ESA, and built a ship based on the best propulsion we have in operation. Forget the car at 100 kilometers per hour, which would take 6 billion years. The fastest object ever built by man is the Parker Solar Probe. Using the sun's gravity to gain momentum, it reaches absurd speeds of almost 700,000 kilometers per hour at its peak moments. But that is cheating, because it is falling towards the sun. Let's use something that is leaving the solar system, Voyager 1. It travels at about 61,000 kilometers per hour. That is fast. Fast enough to cross the United States in minutes. If we pointed a ship with the speed of Voyager 1 towards Kepler 22b, how long would it take? Remember, light takes 600 years. Voyager travels at a tiny fraction of the speed of light. Doing the math, to cover 600 light years at 61,000 kilometers per hour, the trip would take approximately 10 to 11 million years. 10 million years ago, human beings didn't even exist. Our ancestors were primates living in trees in Africa. If we had launched the ship back then, it would be arriving only now. With chemical rockets, the trip is impossible, period. The corrosion of space would destroy the ship before it reached halfway. We need new ideas. We need to look to the future. If we can't go faster, maybe we need to accept slowness. Enter the concept of the generation ship. The idea here isn't to cheat physics, but to accept biology. If we can't bend space, we will bend our perception of life. We would build an ark, a self-sustaining floating city. Let's say we manage to improve our conventional propulsion to reach 1% or 2% of the speed of light. The trip would still take 30,000 to 60,000 years. Would you board this ship knowing that you would never see the destination? Knowing that your children wouldn't see it? Nor your grandchildren? A generation ship would require a perfect society, where every atom of water, air, and food is recycled with 100% efficiency. Nothing can be wasted. But the biggest challenge isn't engineering, it is sociology. How to maintain a culture focused on a mission for a thousand generations? How to ensure that, in the year 15,000 of the trip, the great-grandchildren of the great-grandchildren don't forget why they are traveling, or that they don't decide to turn back, or that a civil war doesn't destroy the life support system? For the inhabitants of this ship, Earth would be just a myth, a legend told in digital archives, and Kepler 22b would be a religious promise. They would live and die in the void between the stars, guardians of a human seed cast into the cosmic wind. It is a possible solution, but it is a terrible and claustrophobic existence. To get there ourselves, we need to break the rules. We need Einstein. What if the answer isn't moving through space, but moving space itself? This is the basis of the warp drive, or space warp theorized by Mexican physicist Miguel Alcubierre in 1994. Alcubierre looked at Einstein's equations and found a loophole. The theory of relativity says that nothing can travel faster than light through space, but it says nothing about the speed at which space can expand or contract. Imagine you are on an airport moving walkway. You are walking slowly, but the floor is moving fast. The warp engine would create a bubble around the ship. In front of the ship, space-time would be compressed, shortening the distance. Behind the ship, space would be expanded, pushing it forward. Inside the bubble, the ship would be stationary relative to local space. The astronauts wouldn't feel acceleration. They would float calmly while the universe around them distorts. If we manage to create a distortion capable of traveling at 10 times the speed of light, the trip to Kepler 22b would drop from millions of years to just 60 years, a human lifetime. 
you would leave Earth young and arrive elderly, but alive. If we reached 100 times the speed of light, we would get there in six years. It would be like a long military service mission, or a PhD in space. Seems perfect, right? But there is a but the size of the universe. To make this work, Alcubierre's equations require something called negative energy, or exotic matter, something that has negative mass. We have never seen this in nature, in macroscopic quantities. Furthermore, the energy required to create this bubble, according to initial calculations, would be greater than the mass of the entire observable universe. More recent calculations have optimized this to the mass of Jupiter, or perhaps that of the Moon. But still, we need a physics we don't yet master, and an energy that we might not be able to control. So, how long would it take us to get to Kepler 22b? With today's technology, eternities. With tomorrow's technology, generations. With the technology of dreams, a lifetime. Kepler 22b remains there, silently orbiting its star 600 light years from here. It is a constant reminder of two facts about humanity, our insignificance in the face of the cosmos's scale and our infinite audacity in wanting to conquer it anyway. Maybe we will never set foot there. Maybe Kepler 22b is a visual destination, a museum that we can only visit with lenses and data, never with boots and flags. But the question remains, if the ship were ready tomorrow, a one-way generation ship, or a dangerous warp drive prototype, would you go? Would you leave Earth forever in search of a new blue sky? Leave your answer in the comments. I want to know who here is an explorer. If you enjoyed this trip through physics and imagination, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell. There are many other worlds for us to explore together. Thanks for watching this far, and see you next time.